Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. We're so excited and pleased to be able to bring you this very special History Revealed program. I'm Robin Priestley with the Ramsey County Historical Society, and I want to thank the Eastside Freedom Library and the Roseville Library for their support and partnership for the History Revealed series, which is going on for a number of years now. Um, before I do more of an introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Peter Ratcliffe from the Eastside Freedom Library to say a couple words, including what's coming up next week. Thank you, Robin. And, and I guess as those of us who care about history realize that the more history that we reveal, the more we discover we still don't know. So I don't think we're ever going to run out of topics. Um, so I'm welcoming you on behalf of the Eastside Freedom Library, um, which is now two months into our eighth year. Uh, and uh, we, our mission is to inspire solidarity, work for justice and advocate for equity for all. And one of our major means to do that is to promote what we call a conversation between the past and the present. And so I'm interested to see tonight how learning about the life and experiences of Lily Bell Gibbs will, will generate some questions for us to think about uh, for the world that we live in today. Um, next week, a week from tonight, uh, we will be hearing from uh, Jacob Jors, uh, who has a PhD from the University of Michigan and will be teaching this coming academic year at McAllister College. Um, Jake's scholarly work looks at interactions between Anishinaabe and Dakota people. And uh, he's put together a presentation, which I think is very intentionally uh, designed as a conversation between the past and the present, uh, challenging us to think about um, how we can go beyond land acknowledgements uh, to promote justice and bring the stories of indigenous people into the center of our awareness. So that will be a week from tonight, again, via Zoom. Um, and you can register either through the Eastside Freedom Library uh, webpage calendar of events or through the Ramsey County Historical Society website. So um, I want to thank Terry and Peggy for putting together a great book uh, and for sharing their process and product with us tonight. And I'll turn things back to Robin. Great. Thank you, Peter. Yes, please join us next week for um, Dr. Jers. And there's a lot more History Reveal programs coming up. So again, check both of our websites for those programs. Um, I want to thank all of our members and supporters who are here tonight. If you're not a member or supporter, please consider joining the Ramsey County Historical Society. We rely on the support of members and friends like you to continue these, to present these programs and all of our efforts, including those at Gibbs Farm. And there's some great benefits to joining. Our editor will be joining us tonight and she puts out and helps publish books like this, as well as our quarterly magazine, which has won a number of awards. And that is a benefit of joining. And um, there's a lot more benefits. You can find more on our website, which is www.rchs.com. Um, I also want to thank Peter for all these years of sponsorship and the Roseville Library from the Ramsey County Library System. Um, we love having the partnership together with all these wonderful organizations. So as a reminder, if you can keep your microphones and videos turned off for the time being, please put your questions and comments in the chat and we'll take care of reading those out for Terry and Peggy to answer. And um, after the program, we'll turn off the recording and we can all share it together and you'll be able to turn on your microphones and cameras. So we do have a statement um, that acknowledges the sacred Dakota land. Minnesota Mekoche, the land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds, is the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. It is also home to the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledges that its sites are located on and benefit from these sacred Dakota lands.
Ramsey County Historical Society is committed to preserving our past, informing our present, and inspiring our future. Part of doing so is acknowledging the painful history and current challenges facing the Dakota people just as we celebrate the contributions of Dakota and other Indigenous peoples. You can find our full land acknowledgement statement on our website. Again, that's www.rchs.com, which includes actionable ways in which Ramsey County Historical Society pledges to honor the Dakota and other Indigenous peoples of Minnesota Makoche. So as Peter mentioned, we have more history than we can possibly cover. But this year, 2022, we are presenting the stories and histories that may have been overlooked or forgotten. And so these programs are focused on making Minnesota, which will explore the, again, those untold stories, histories, and experiences, some of the worldwide immigrant, African American, and Indigenous communities that make up our most diverse county. And so tonight, we have a very special program with um, Terry Swanson and Peggy Stern. And I'm going to turn it over to Meredith Cummings, our editor, to introduce them. Thank you, Meredith. Hi everyone, I'm Meredith. Thank you, Robin. Um, just a note before we begin, uh, it's my turn <laughs> for COVID. So I'm going to remain off camera tonight and I will, will be muting when I'm not speaking. Um, if I forget to turn my mic back on, uh, do yell at me and, and we'll go from there. Um, that said, we are absolutely thrilled to be here with you tonight to talk about this new historical fiction book uh, which launched earlier this summer and is already gaining a lot of interest, not only from our young readers, but really multi-generational readers. And it's all thanks to our author and illustrator. So I, wanna, I want to introduce them now. Um, Terry Swanson is a Minnesota historian who has specialized in public history in the Twin Cities area since 1990. She was director of collections, education and programs at the American Swedish Institute from 1997 to 2005. She worked as a program and site manager at Ramsey County Historical Society's Gibbs Farm from 2007 to 2016. Since retiring in 2017, retiring, um, <laughs> she has worked as a historical consultant and with Investigate Minnesota, a partnership designed for school-aged children to boost academic achievement and help close the achievement gap. And then Peggy Stern, um, is a former site <clears throat> interpreter at Gibbs Farm, where under the direction of Terry, she handcrafted murals and signage to enhance the venue. Their working relationship eventually developed into a collaboration for this really cool book. Stern holds a degree in fine art from the University of Wisconsin River Falls and has continued her art education at Minneapolis College of Art and Design and at both Minnetonka and White Bear Centers for the Arts. So welcome to you both. We're really thrilled you can be here. Um, so let's get started with the first reading from the book. Terry, would you read Lily's first entry? And you'll need to you'll need to turn your mic on, Terry. Here we go. Can you hear me now? Can you yep. hear me? Yes. Right. yes, yes. Okay, so this is uh, the opening entry of the book. It's dated Monday, December 25th, 1876. My name is Lily Bell Gibbs. I was born on Christmas Day in 1865, 11 years ago today. My parents think I am now mature enough to keep a journal, so they gave me one as a gift. Father says I should record each day's activities faithfully. Mother says I should note my feelings about all that happens. Writing something every day seems a daunting task, one to which I am not completely committed, but I will try my best. When I asked father why I would keep a journal, he said for posterity. I had not learned the word in school, so I looked it up in our big dictionary. After reading the definition, I decided two things. First, because I love to draw, I will illustrate this journal, which will help me tell the story of my year when words fail. Second, for posterity, I will get started recording my days in earnest. Tomorrow, for now I must help mother in the kitchen. 
Even on my birthday and Christmas, there are chores. Nice, I love that. Um, so for posterity, why don't you tell us a little bit about who, um, who was Lily Bell? Okay, well, Lily Bell Gibbs is the, was the youngest daughter, youngest child, actually, of Jane and Heman Gibbs. Jane and Heman Gibbs came to this area right after Minnesota became a new territory in 1849. They bought 160 acres. As you can see from the map on the screen, what says Minneapolis Road, that is today's Larpenter Avenue. So Heman bought a farm that 160 acres that was divided, bisected really by that road, which served him well later on because by the time Lily came around in 1865, Heman had already sold off over 100 acres of his farm. He decided he was going to become a market gardener. And because of that, uh, he didn't need acres and acres of land. He needed a smaller kind of uh, farm where he could grow smaller crops to sell in this amazing St. Paul that was growing, but also in St. Anthony in Minneapolis. So uh, that was sort of Lily's beginning. You can see on this map also Indian Trail. And um, one of the unique things about this farm is that there was a trail that uh, crossed the land that Dakota people used every fall when they went wild racing. So this family had a long relationship with Dakota people. All right, thanks. Um, to, to tell us a little more about her, could you read the two entries from January 1st and 2nd from the book? Okay, so here's Monday, January 1st. So this is a few days after um, <laughs> Lily's birthday. I have been struggling to think of what to write each and every day. I'm just an ordinary farm girl and my days do not seem very special. I have spoken to mother about this. She says she now wishes she had kept a journal when she was a girl, but then mother had a remarkable childhood. I could listen to stories of her life when she was my age forever. I especially love the story mother tells about Cloud Man's granddaughter, Winona, and the other children at the Dakota village at Lake Calhoun as they tried to teach her the Dakota language. She and Winona, would get to, get to giggling over her pronunciation. And then in time, all of them would tease mother about words she mispronounced. Whenever she shares, shares that story, she starts giggling again without fail. And in that moment, it seems as if I can see the young girl she was back then. But she is convinced there's much she has forgotten. I also talked to Abby about trying to write in this book for nearly 365 days. She has kept a journal for several years and says she always pretended the journal was a new friend, a dear girl she could tell everything to. I so like that idea that I will start 1877 with that thought in mind. My hope is that by the time I celebrate my next birthday, I will have shared everything about this year of my life in these pages. Maybe there will even be an adventure or two. This one signed Lily Bella. I do want to back up because I did say on the screen, um, Meredith had Lily, Lily Bell, Lily Bella. And that comes from Lily's school journal and how she signed off. And I think because she was 11 years old, she was uh, trying to figure out who she was. And someday she was Lily and someday she was Lily Bell. And my favorite, someday she was Lily Bella. So the next one is Tuesday, January 2nd. And it starts out, I love to read, which happens to be an important quality to have in my family. Father expects me to read every day, not including my daily schoolwork and Bible study. I finished Hans Bricker last week. I loved how Mary Mapes Dodge made Holland come alive in that book as Hans raced across the frozen canals on skates. I have been waiting to pick up another book because I would like to read Little Women next, but Abby is reading it and is only halfway through it. Father suggested I read Swiss Family Robinson, which he has read several times. He thinks I will enjoy this story. I started it last night. Right away in the first chapter, there's a shipwreck 
After a great storm, the crew leaves the family stranded, so they use barrels to make a sort of raft to carry them to a nearby island. Luckily, there are tools and weapons and even food on board, some of which they manage to take along. In the story, besides the father and mother, there are four brothers. Jack, the third oldest, is my age. They also have two dogs named Turk and Juno. They find a baby monkey on the island that they keep as a pet and named Nip. I cannot imagine what it must have been like to be shipwrecked and so far away from home. Lily Bell. Thank you. I love those two entries. Um, and so as you've now heard, <clears throat> one of the threads throughout the book is that Lily is kind of a reluctant diarist. Her parents gave her this um, diary and that part is a fiction, that is one of the fictions here and, and Terry will be talking about that a little later, but um, she's a reluctant diarist. She doesn't think that she leads an extraordinary life, especially compared to her mother. You just heard about her mother's adventures. Um, Terry, can you explain a little more about the mother's adventures as a child and how as Lily begins her diary, she starts by sharing more adventures from books because she doesn't have, she doesn't believe that she, that living on the farm provides any adventure at all. So that's kind of the conundrum right. she's in. She's, 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 she's in awe of her mother and thinks, well, what, what adventure do I have? So could you explain that a little bit more? Right. Which, and I just want to say an aside here, because one of the things in, over the course of this that I've come to think about is uh, when I was at Gibbs, I used to say to kids all the time, was Jane an extraordinary woman or girl, depending on what part of your, her life you were looking at, who lived an ordinary life or an ordinary girl or woman who lived an extraordinary life? And in a way, I kind of feel the same way about Lily too. And hopefully I'll have a chance to talk more about that. Jane Gibbs, uh, which... Actually, she was born, Jane DeBow was born um, in New York in 1827. She was um, the youngest for a long time in her family until her mother had the last baby. And after that, her mother fell and was injured and subsequently passed away. As that process was happening, another family came through um, Batavia, New York, where Jane lived, and that was uh, Jedediah Stevens, who was missionary, and his wife, Julia, who was from Batavia originally, and they decided jointly, along with the family, that they would bring Lily West with them, and so Lily came west and all the way to Fort Snelling. Now, when we say Fort Snelling today, most of us just think of the fort, but that um, treaty that was signed with Dakota people back in 1805 was a large tract of land. And um, there was a village at what was then called Lake Calhoun, which is today Bidet Makaska, where Jane uh, spent time, she lived at Lake Harriet, spent five years of her life from 1835 to 1839. She learned the Dakota language. She became friends with the Dakota people, especially the women of the village. Uh, she knew Cloud Man. And those stories were stories that the entire family was raised on. And it is a remarkable story to be sure. It feels to me always like that story is one that Lily um, grasped onto more than the other children. And uh, she, when she grew up, she wrote a book, a pamphlet really called Little Bird That Was Caught, which is what Dakota people called uh, Jane when they discovered her story and how she had come out here without her family, without her parents. And um, that little pamphlet has led to a lot of how we interpret things at the Gibbs farm. So it's kind of like I said, Jane and Lily, both ordinary and extraordinary. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and, and, and like I said, one of the threads is kind of her love of books. Um, and and you, you've put some of the books from her era that she may have read as a child. And, and so in the beginning, you can see that she, she, She's focused more on the adventures in the books, but that will change as we go through. I wanna stay for a minute on this image um, 
that Peggy drew of the Swiss family Robinson. So it's, it's in a sense illustrated by Lily, but of course it's illustrated by Peggy uh, in real life. And you'll, <clears throat> you'll be seeing more images like this tonight. Notice the detail and how each image is drawn. Not all diarists illustrate their work. In fact, <clears throat> Terry hadn't even considered using illustrations at first, but then she changed her mind given the audience and <clears throat> what we knew of Lily's artistic background. So Peggy, <clears throat> excuse me, explain how you channeled this farm girl um, as an 11 year old artist and created this delicate artwork. Well, I think um, it wasn't all that difficult to channel her um, because I felt very much like, you know, the idea of a, of a journal and, and illustrating was one is something I've been doing for years just for myself, you know, to cat just categorize things that I see in the world around me on trips and vacations and things like that. So it really was kind of a, a natural to you know, go through the manuscript that that Terry had given me and and look for the visuals that I could find in there. And there were so many, you know, I would just highlight them and then um, do little pictures because it just that's kind of what popped into my head. And so I would just fill the margins with little pictures till there were about <laughs> 230 plus pictures. So um, it's it's just something that is kind of natural to me being a visual person. I I hear stories and I see pictures. So it's uh, it was a delightful project. Perfect. Um, so I, I want to we're going to explore some of your illustrations here in this next slide. As soon as I can move it over here. There we go, there we go. So <laughs> here you can see um, the behind the scenes of, of Peggy the artist, and you can see the many versions that she tried. You can see how she started in pencil, how she tried different colors, different sizes. Um, and she had notebooks and notebooks and notebooks full of this, which then once she selected the, you know, what she wanted, and we turned this over to a designer, then the designer would pull it and incorporate it into the book. And it was, it was a long process. Um, Peggy, could you explain a little bit about what challenged and inspired you as you created these illustrations and the cover all by hand? And how much time did it take? Well, it was a process over about five years, you know, and it was, um, I think the, the, inspiration obviously came from the collaboration of the book and you know since Terry and I had both worked at Gibbs Museum we both had the um, the love and passion for this story and so it, it just seemed like a natural I was very honored that she asked me to do this and um, so that was the inspire the inspiration really is is um, I think it's important to record this history and what a, an amazing opportunity that, you know, Terry was willing to do all the research and, and bring this idea to, to life. So, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, as you see, looking at these <laughs> reminds me of all the work. Uh, just look at these pictures because it, it was like, you know, I would do picture after picture after picture and they would you know if it didn't wasn't quite right then I would take what I thought was okay and then try it again and try it again and try it again it was sort of an evolutionary process you know like in this one for instance you can see the big blot right there Terry is sitting at her desk I tried putting her at her desk and I think I was putting her dog in there I think up you know there were just different elements I was trying out and then um the final one um, of her and me, you know, I tried to make it uh, her with her, like try to see the things that are symbolic of what she did, you know, the, the desk that she had. Uh, she stands at her desk. I stand at my easel. You know, I tried to make it so that it was um, 
and the light, the light, you know, things that were synonymous that that um, blended, that made sense. So, um, yeah, I just took inspiration from the story, really, and and uh, her word pictures gave life to my imagination. You want to talk a little bit about the cover? <laughs> the cover. <laughs> Well, the cover, again, was another evolutionary process. And um, you can see the three different ones here. We tried out many different things. And there were some even before we had the, the title. The title was a process, too. And there were many attempts at trying to figure out what would be the best title. And, um, you know, you wanted something. I wanted something that represented the book and represented Lily and uh, you know, made that strong statement. And so there were, um, I think the first few one, few, I, I kind of thought quilt, you know, because quilt sort of speaks of, uh, Terry had written stories about Lily sewing quilts and things. And so I tried kind of a quilt design and then um, it kind of morphed. And you can sort of see in the middle there with the purple border. Um, that was an attempt at kind of a quilt design. And then um, I was just doing some research on quilts and came across crazy quilts. And I thought, well, this would be kind of an interesting idea, something fun. And crazy quilts were sort of, they were developed around the Victorian era. So we felt that a crazy quilt idea would be kind of indicative of, of Lily in her Victorian, you know, she's moving from the um, from pre-Victorian into the Victorian era, and that might represent her, you know, a crazy quilt. And but then, as we moved along, as I moved along with the designs, it um, the crazy quilt became a little too crazy, and it was difficult to read. And we all kind of agreed that. Um, maybe we should tone it down a little bit. And what I kept from that crazy quilt were the stitches, because in the 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 beauty of a crazy quilt, if you look closely and examine it, it's just full of very experimental, fun stitches. People were moving from the traditional quilt, and they were having fun with with these um, sewing projects and they were coming up with very inventive stitching. So I just kind of tried to use that. I thought maybe, you know, keep the, the stitching and that represents Lily as a girl who spent time sewing and we can imagine. And um, so that uh, did many, 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 again, an evolutionary process, experimenting with the lettering and placement and so forth. And, and finally, we ended up choosing one <laughs> after probably about, I don't know how many I did, 15, 20, you know, hand done. A lot. And I, and I should share, um, Peggy doesn't just do sketches. She makes each example Perfect. <laughs> and we kept saying, just do a sketch so we can get an idea. But she 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 would do these beautiful attempts, you know, that took hours and hours and hours. And then we'd vote against one and go on to the next one. So we it was it was um, we really appreciate all of your time and talent that you put well, into that. Thank you. It was, a, it was a, a labor of love. You know, I mean, it's it's work, but it's work that was certainly rewarding. Yes. Um, now, Peggy had touched on the on the title, so I want to go to that. I want to touch on that for a minute. Um, switch slides here. So grasshoppers in my bed. Typically, when working on a book, every manuscript has a working title. And ours from the beginning was Lily Bell Gibbs, Minnesota, Minnesota Farm Girl, 1877. But we knew that that needed, we needed pop, we needed pizzazz, we needed something 
more. Um, so Terry, can you explain how during the editorial process we came up with this title and what its significance is to the history of the time? And then also um, go back and read the entry from April 26th, if you don't mind. Well, we did, you know, as you said, we talked and talked and talked about different things that we would call the book. And actually my title always in my head was The Lily Project. That's what I called it from the very beginning. And um, then, uh, you know, we just kept, we couldn't never quite get to the right thing. And so it sort of sat there for a while. We just decided let's let it sit. And then one day when we were at Meredith's house doing having an editorial meeting, um, I had written uh, the back cover. Meredith had asked me if I'd write the back cover and Peggy hadn't seen it. So um, I started to read it. I'm gonna read it right now. It's, it starts out, it is 1876 Christmas day, which just happens to be the 11th birthday of Lily Bell Gibbs. Her mother and father present her with a new journal. Now she must decide how to fill the pages. Second paragraph is grasshoppers in her bed. And I just stopped and I said, that's the title. <laughs> and I guess we all just agreed upon it. And the thing about it is it's interesting now is that a lot of people think that this is a book about the grasshopper invasion. And, you know, it, it is in a moment. And that is also part of what's important to get across is that this is an 11 year old girl. Um, and it was an important part of her life, but she also had a life full of other things. So it was that one moment. I do think, however, it's really important writing a work of historical fiction to ground your characters in events of the time, not just in events of their own story. And the grasshopper invasion was a really important um, part of Minnesota history for seven years, not just Minnesota, the entire upper Midwest. So I'm gonna read, actually, I'm just gonna read part of this, um, Meredith, because it's pretty long. But you'll see why I'm going to stop where I am. So it says the grasshoppers have come each. This is a Thursday, April 26. The grasshoppers has, have come each summer for many years. The first time was when I was only seven and I was so frightened. Mother and I were in the front room ironing. It had been a lovely June morning, bright and sunny. Suddenly the sky turned black as night as if a terrible storm was headed our way. As the cloud got closer, we began to hear a roar, and in a matter of minutes, it sounded like hail hitting the house, but it was grasshoppers. Father says they are Rocky Mountain locusts, but everyone around here just calls them grasshoppers. It seems I find them everywhere in the house. It is still shocking to pull back the bedclothes, pull back my bedclothes and find grasshoppers in my bed. And so that is why we chose that title, kind of a spontaneous moment, but it is very much a bigger story within Lily's day-to-day -day life. Um, I would like to also just go back and say one thing about the images, if I may, and it is that um, it is true initially, I did not think about having the book illustrated, but then it was suggested to me that we have um, endnotes in this book. And this book is written as a historical fiction for children, mainly. I do agree with Meredith. It does seem like a lot of adults are really enjoying this book. But it just um, seemed like endnotes. I mean, I take college courses every single semester at the University of Minnesota, and the students I'm going to school with don't read endnotes. I can't imagine that these 11-year-old, 8-year-old, 9-year-old girls are going to, kids are going to be reading endnotes. So the next step seemed like illustrations could be our endnotes. So I guess when you go through the book, that is a thing to think about. I think Peggy has just done such a superb job of using these illustrations to I don't know, sort of punctuate the story in a way if, if people might not know what something is, there's a, an amazing illustration of it to help them out. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, and one part that she, she didn't read, but that I, I just find fascinating, I'm not from Minnesota, but 
Um, one of our other programs that we do at Ramsey County Historical Society is a series of podcasts about the Minnesota governors. And there was a governor um, who he was uh, in office at this time in 1877 uh, when Lily was 11. And the, the country or the state was so desperate and the fields had been decimated, everything had just been decimated. And so he actually that spring um, hosted a, a state day of prayer, um, which was really, which I find really interesting. And it's mentioned in the podcast and it's mentioned in this book as well. Um, and then sure enough, they stopped. Um, although the reality was that it, there was a late freeze that season. So those eggs in the ground, <laughs> um, that there were no more grasshoppers, but just, it's, it's just fascinating how history comes together. Um, so, um, you know, every page is, is a history lesson and it's just fascinating. Right. And um, this particular entry, this Thursday, April 26th, was the day of prayer in 1877. Yes. And uh, the other thing that I love about that is, you know, Peter said about making a connection, how things of the past can be today. I find it so interesting how when we go through anything that's trying in our world, that's what we do. We have maybe not a day of prayer, maybe our governor doesn't proclaim a day of prayer, but we see people holding vigils after a shooting or after some difficult um, experience that we have. So it is that shared experience that, I mean, that's a through thread that we have there from Lily's time all the way to ours. Right. Okay. Um, so one of the most important things that we haven't touched on yet is the history behind this book. Uh, you scoured and scoured and scoured the artifacts and the manuscripts and other materials at Ramsey County Historical Society and at Gibbs Farm. And in doing that, you realized that Lily had left a lot of clues as to what her life and her family's life lives were like. Um, we have, our CHS has her Bible, her dictionary, photographs, drawings, schoolwork from her when she was 11 and even her handwriting samples, which are amazing. Um, and, and we've included some of those in the book. So if you could talk a little bit about those precious materials, Terry. Yeah, and you know, what's really remarkable to me, Meredith, about this is that um, so many things, when Lily uh, probably was about my age now, she wrote um, down some of her experiences about what it was like to live on Gibbs Farm when she was a girl. And those are things that have been used at Gibbs Farm and even been published in our magazine, Ramsey County History. Um, but there sits all this amazing contemporaneous material from when Lily was 11 years old in 1877. I cannot overstate how unique this is and how, um, how lucky we are to have those resources. We, as you said, we have our school journal. That was absolutely my um, most favorite thing of all. I probably camped out in that, um, in that school journal for months and months and months because, so some of the articles are things like insects or flowers or um, trees. And so nothing that really seemed to provide that much great historic significance. But what I wanted to get out of those is Lily the words that she would use, her intonation, her style of writing, how she thought, what she thought about. And you can really get those out of that. But then there's some um, amazing essays that she wrote, um, a couple in particular. She wrote, she had one called How I Spent My Vacation, which probably we all wrote that essay when we, at some point in school. Um, and in that essay, she starts out by saying, this was the most boring year ever or summer ever. And, but then she proceeds to talk about how she spent the first two weeks of her summer vacation picking strawberries. And then she talks about um, sorting the strawberries and helping her father pack the strawberries to take the strawberries to all the women who are waiting for the strawberries. And so of course this was, that is an amazing historic document. What Lily is saying is 
that she was part of the labor force on this farm. This was truly a working family farm and Lily was part of that. So that is a very unique document. I doubt that very many documents of that sort where a child is writing contemporaneously about their experience as part of the labor force at age 11 exist. Also, um, she wrote one about Rosetown Schoolhouse and for anybody who's been involved at Gibbs for very long knows that um, forever we've talked about Mary Lake, who was the school teacher there, and she lived with the family. But in the last paragraph of this essay for her school journal, as an 11 year old girl, she starts to name all the teachers that she's had. And this is a whole new piece of um, historical evidence for us to know who those teachers were and what the order was. And in fact, Mary Lake only taught at that school for about a half of one season. She did teach uh, Lily and her brother Frank, or, or, yeah, her brother Frank in their um, parlor for the first two years. But um, this is, it's so amazing that we could have had those documents sitting there all that time that we really didn't use as historians. And I think that that is um, one of the things about this book that I think is really uh, important and um, I can't really overstate enough is that often at historic sites, there are not people who can do research. Um, there's not that much money at a lot of historic sites and people are busy running historic sites. And so this is really, um, even though it's historical fiction, it is so grounded in research and in Lily's actual day-to-day -day life that I think it really provides um, a wonderful window into what life was like for an 11-year-old girl living on a farm at that time in Minnesota. And so um, I think it's something that um, well, that I'm proud of, but I think we can all be proud of it because it really does open up a whole new world for us. You know, it's important for us to talk about all the people that lived in a place. Um, so, you know, I'm really um, gratified that Ramsey County Historical Society had all of those records and so many that dated right to that particular year. That is why we chose 1877 is because we have all those documents of that year. And could you touch on a couple of his, uh, historical events? For example, this is a great timing for the state fair. Could you touch on that a little bit? Um, she did, she also has an essay about the state fair. Um, let's see, I'll see if I can, did you want me to read that? It's kind of a long, kind of a long one. Uh, yeah, if you don't, if, if you don't mind, I think it's on page. Uh, yeah, I've got it, yeah. You got it? Okay, so this is uh, Saturday, September 8th. <clears throat> we went to Minneapolis for the state fair today. For a few years now, there has been kind of competition between St. Paul and Minneapolis over which city would host the fair. This year, Mr. Bill King of Minneapolis won out. Folks say this fair will draw the largest crowds ever. The horse-drawn streetcar brought us right to the fairgrounds. People came and covered wagons from all over Minnesota and other states too. There were new buildings built just for the fair, an agricultural hall, a mechanical hall, and an art hall, all filled with interesting and odd exhibits. I saw a seven pound beat, if you can imagine. And we watched elk trotters, which are elk hitched to small race carts, carry drivers around a dirt race track, for the first time, there was a Minneapolis exposition with so many interesting products made right here, including a large sec section of woolen sacks with, uh, and flower bags. Folks around these parts are proud of these new containers. Father says it is less expensive for the bags to be shipped. And mother says cloth sacks are easier for women, for her and other mothers to store in pantries compared to barrels, which take up so much room. We brought a picnic lunch, although there are many stands where food could be purchased. We did buy ice cream cones after dinner. Abby said we were not to bring our cones in the animal exhibit, but I did not listen. Halfway down the aisle, my ice cream plopped over right into the pig pen. 
Everyone knows pigs will eat anything, and that is just what happened. I stood there with my mouth open as I watched a uh, sow gobble the last of my treat. In the midst of all that fuss, I lost track of my family. There were so many people and I didn't see them anywhere. Finally, I spotted them a few rows over and hurried to catch up. If they had known I was lost, I never would have heard the end of it. So although my heart was pounding, I did not let in. Let on. I have been to the fair before, but honestly, this was the biggest and best, even if it was in Minneapolis. We saw a large fountain with fish swimming around in the water. Upstairs in one hall, there was a churn <clears throat> that could make butter in 10 minutes, which I think is fantastical. I do not think that's a word, but I like the sound of it. Uh, so for now, so it is for now, as far as I'm concerned. Later, I saw birds made of wax. There was even a show with a man who trained birds to fly out into the audience and return to him when called. My head is spinning when I think about everything we saw, Lily Bell. And so, you know, that is a true thing that was going on between Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, that King Fair and that year was considered one of the biggest, best events of the year. So just luckily it happened in 1877. So that could be part of this book too. Perfect, thank you. And, and there are lots of other historical events uh, throughout the book. I wanted to show this illustration. This is one of my favorites of Peggy's. Um, I just love this one. And so you'll find this, uh, if, if you haven't read the book, we, we encourage you to uh, purchase a copy. This is um, from a section in the book where Lily and her mother are walking and, and Jane, her mother is, is reminiscing about her time with the Dakota. And I just think this illustration is beyond beautiful. Um, so I wanted to include that today. Um, before, before we move on, uh, Terry, is there anything with this book that, um, as you were going on, that you learned about Lily that you didn't know before? I know you worked 10 years at Gibbs, so you were already in it, but what did you learn um, that you didn't know before? Well, that's a kind of an interesting question because I think if we would have had this uh, history re revealed two months ago, uh, right after the book was published, I probably would have said some different things that I'm going to say now. And uh, I am such an extrovert that part of how I process is by talking. And now we've had two months to talk about this book and talk about Lily. So I've got to, I'm actually still searching for Lily. I'm still um, getting to know her. I think that writing a book is a process that probably never ends. I, you have to get to a point sometime where you go, the end, <laughs> but it doesn't really end. And especially if you love the subject matter. I think from a historian standpoint though, what I did learn the most is um, about how working at that site for all those years, I never really, and I had looked at all the documents in the um, Ramsey County Historical Society Research Center, which I would give an amazing plug for anybody who has a chance to use that site or that um, historic um, uh, venue there to do research. It's uh, really top notch, but um, I never really stopped to think until I was writing this book how much of what we say at Gibbs Farm really is based on Lily and uh, and, the, and the documents that she left. And part of it is because Lily is the one that wrote things down. You know, Abby, her older sister, was not a person. We don't, we almost have nothing of Abby's. And we have some of Frank's, but not much. And almost Jane is pretty silent. And it's Abby, it's Abby's words. And so that's an interesting thing. And that's another reason I think this book is really important because we start to see, even though this is about Lily and even though it's based on Lily's writings, we start to see a different Lily and a different way um, of understanding uh, what life was like on that farm. Hello? Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so now we're going to uh, switch a little bit to Peggy. Um, 
and this beautiful penmanship that um, we have samples of Lily's writing and, and Peggy really studied that. Um, Peggy, Terry, you and you, you just had a lot of discussions about the use of cursive in the illustrations because most children today don't learn handwriting in school. And you both were concerned that your audience would not be able to read the words. Um, still, all of Lily's documentation was in longhand. Can you um, talk a little bit about that if you wanna read a little bit from the excerpt from May 11th or just talk about it and explain why penmanship references were ultimately included here? Well, I think this harkens back to you know what is historical. And we did have a lot of discussion about this because, you know, it's important that this is is um, something that the, the children especially can can read, you know. And so many children, um, they may they may be learning cursive, but I'm finding that they're just not being um, they're not using it. It's it's there. They revert back to the the printing style, which. On a personal note, I feel is is rather sad because I I have always, as a person who's always enjoyed the tactile, um, the 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 effect of of cursive. You know, the, it has a wonderful motion, and I find it very expressive. And so I guess I've always I, I just felt it was um, very important to to show it um, in you know, the illustrations, of course, in the body of the, the text, you, you wouldn't have wanted to use it because, of course, it would be hard to read. But um, to show it in the in the artwork, you know, considering it as a, as artwork. Um, and and here you see the, the, the flowers, the meaning of the flowers. And and so um, it shows how beautiful it is and it's historical it is the kind of writing that children of lily's age were were learning and so i i just felt it was very important to at least show some samples of it i especially love this picture of the flowers and and their meanings i think that's a really a special touch in the book um, Peggy, do you have a favorite passage in the book that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, that that is difficult because there are very many. <laughs> there's quite a few that I really do enjoy. Um, but uh, being pressed to do to choose something, I guess I would choose on um, June twelfth. Tuesday, June twelfth was um, this. This entry is based on. Uh, a true story of a birthday party for Mrs. Hendrickson. It says, today was the big day. Mrs. Hendrickson's birthday party was well attended, to be sure. I would venture a guess that we had 120 people there. Frank and the Hendrickson boys set up a dozen tables with straw bales for seating, and all the tables were full. Children ran everywhere and took turns on the swing hanging from their old oak tree, which as you can see in this picture is what I, I chose to, to, um, to illustrate. Some folks were playing croquet and several men pitched horseshoes. The food tables were loaded with pickles, breads, butter, meats piled high, platters of cheese, hard cooked eggs, warmed asparagus, and of course, many desserts besides Abby's famous pies. Nobody went hungry. There's some choice things here, I think that uh, make this one something I really do enjoy because for one thing, I mean, I think very often we think of people in the past as almost black and white, like there isn't any color back then, I, or they, they're different than us or whatever. And I think um, Terry has done a really good job with the writing and making it you know, not only something of the past, but something that we can relate to, you know, when we go to picnics and with our families and playing croquet. And and I love how there are connections, even though this is historical fiction, you know, that that um, there are things that relate to things that we do today, you know, playing 
croquet, pitching horseshoes. And, and then I love, I just, I love all the references to food in this, in this, in this book and uh, describing that table with all the, the hard cooked eggs, warm asparagus, you know, I mean, I read these, these food entries and it's just like, okay, now it's time for dinner. <laughs> I'm going to cook something good. I mean, it just, it, it whets your appetite. It, it's, uh, you know, beautifully written in that in that way and then of course it says but the best of all was the sound of laughter and I think we can all relate to that and I think that's what really shows that you know a very I think there's a very heartwarming thread that runs through this whole book too you know a very a very real um uh experience that a young girl is 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 feeling on a very tactile level so I guess that's why I like that one I like that one too Mm -hmm. I like most all of them. <laughs> They're all wonderful. Well, and, you um, know, can I say a thing about this one too? Because as Peggy's talking, all of the things, I mean, not all, but many of the things in this one <coughs> come out of research or come out of something, a personal story. So when we talk about the food and the bread and the pickles, so I worked with Karen Dosh off and on since the whole time I ever came to Gibbs Farm. <laughs> Karen is the great I can never quite get this right, but I believe it's right to say she's the great, great granddaughter of Jane Gibbs. She's the great granddaughter of Lily Bell Gibbs. And um, she just used to pound in my head that at every meal they would have bread and they would have pickles. So you can look at many entries throughout this book and you will see bread and pickles. <laughs> and that's an ode to care to Karen, I think it's really uh, uh, important to include those things that you learn, but also what Peggy said about the Hendricksons. Um, they were best friends of Jane and Heman, and I did their whole genealogy so that I could be sure that I'm getting it right with um, Minna, uh, Lily's best friend. And then I found this amazing write up in the collection that we have of her great granddaughter being interviewed and her birthday happens to be on June 12th. So that's why it's the entry in this. And every year she would have this big birthday party. So, you know, we just tried to um, take all the threads we could and make them come true in the book. <laughs> nice. Um, let's go back to the idea of the diary again. Um, so we know that she did not leave a diary behind. And so that's why we've created one. Um, but diaries are, there's a lot of reasons you chose that, that genre, but one is that diaries are good listeners. And <clears throat> besides writing about the good things that happen every day, it's easy to write privately about other things like when you're worried or angry or annoyed with your siblings. Um, so <laughs> on that note, Terry, could you tell us about the Gibbs children briefly and their relationships and age differences and how you addressed sibling rivalry in the book? Yeah, and you know, 11, that's, the, that's an age when that starts to come about. And I felt it was really important to include that because it's a reality of life. Um, Abby um, is the first natural born daughter of Jane and Heman Gibbs, and she's 10 years older than Lily. Ida was the actual first child, and she was adopted by the family when she was two years old. So Ida was born in 1852, and then in 1855 came Abby. Then between Abby and Frank, there was a boy named Willie who died, um, uh, got too much smoke in his lungs following a prairie burn. And when I see that picture there that Peggy drew of Abby, of Ida, Abby, Frank, and me, I always see a space between Abby and Frank because, of course, Willie was a major part of the family. He passed away when he was nine years old. And to think about um, those kinds of tragic situations that can happen in any family and how a family just continues on. And then Frank and then um, Lily. Frank was born in 1862. And as I've said a few times, Abby was born in 1865. I love that Peggy put those hands there because I see that <clears throat> framed picture up at the um, boxes of Frank and Lily. And that there's an entry in the book about that. And that picture does hang on the wall in the parlor of the Gibbs farmhouse. 
And I think that the two of them were always really close. And then when I was writing this book, lo and behold, I got a picture from Sammy, who's the current manager at Gibbs Farm, of Frank and Lily side by side when they're adults in Frank's greenhouse and they're not holding hands. You can't see that part, but they're in the same position and you get this same, Lily has this kind of sweet little grin on her face like my big brother. And I think that she always did look up to Frank. Um, and I think for Lily more than any of the other children in the family, family meant everything to her. And I really wanted that to come through in the book. Um, part of it is because of the spread out, you know, I mean, I have that in my family. I have, there's 13 years in my family and I can definitely see a difference between my youngest sister and my oldest sister, what's important to them. But I also felt that it was important to, especially there were sometimes little barbs between Abby and Lily. And I think that that was an important part to include as well. Uh, and I think that also when Heman, um, in, in 1873, Heman had a slight stroke and he couldn't do as much on the farm. And um, all of a sudden Frank was thrust into a different role and he got a different set of responsibilities. And like I said, losing um, Willie, it's, these things in families, they can um, impact the way a family structure is. And I think that Lily saw this I don't know, maybe she was losing her brother in a way, but still always looked up to him as her big brother. So it was a really important relationship. And I think that all the children um, were important to Lily, but especially Frank. Perfect. Um, we're, we're getting shorter on time here. So I'm gonna do a little bit of skipping around here, but could you continue, Terry, um, just talk briefly about the importance of education um, in the family? Yeah, well, you know, Heman was a school teacher. He, Heman was many things. <laughs> he was a farmer. He was a school teacher. He worked in the lead mines in uh, Wisconsin and Galena, Illinois, where he met Jane. Uh, and then he moved here and um, started that farm. And that's well, that's one of the things that Frank used to say. My father wasn't a very good farmer because I think for Frank, he thought if you're going to be a farmer, you're going to be a farmer all the way. But for Heman, he, uh, the, the line that is family lore that everyone always used is that um, Heman would drag the whole family. That's the, the way they talked about it. Heman would drag them to all sorts of different events, concerts and, um, and lectures and and he also subscribed, you know, we have his um, ledgers. He wrote everything down. He kept track of everything, every penny that he spent and every penny that he earned. And he did subscribe to newspapers and he bought books for his children. And, um, you know, one of my favorite books uh, makes it into the, into the uh, book is a, a birthday gift for Frank that uh, is, um, it's uh, apples of gold and there are many, many images in the book and Frank has drawn in pipes and cigars on all the men. But, you know, for Heman, the reading and, you know, even just down to that, it's an expect expectation that Lily would read every day. Uh, so that was really an important thing. They started the one room schoolhouse across the street. Um, Heman was, uh, really ran that school in the beginning. He's got all the records of everything that he spent on the school. And um, so it was very important. And like I said, the first teacher they hired and she lived with them and uh, education was a very important aspect of their life. And so now I think that for me, first of all, as a lifelong reader, but also as a historian, it's really important that we use a book like Grasshoppers in My Bed to educate children so they can learn about history, but also that they can read. I think that um, kids spend a lot of time behind screens these days and to be able to have the opportunity to have a special book that one of the reasons I wrote this as a diary format is that I felt like it would be an easy 
exploration venue, if you will, for kids that they could almost search out the things that they were looking for. Each one of the entries is almost like a little mini story in and of itself. And um, nothing's random in here. Everything is connected to, um, to research or to Lily's family or to things that were actually happening at that time. And I think if kids can really um, have some time to search the book for threads and themes that are in this book, besides just the straightforward um, entries in the book, they can really understand a lot about Minnesota history at the time. Um, in the back, um, Meredith has put up, there is a timeline of um, Lily's life and a discussion about Gibbs family. There's a little kind of mini glossary. And of course, you know, if kids can maybe be inspired by this and be like Peggy and keep a journal. I've never kept a journal in my life. That's not how my brain works, but I think that it's a really good opportunity for um, young readers to think about um, starting that kind of a um, idea in their own lives. Thank you. Um, yeah, the back has just a ton of great resources that kids can go back and, and look, um, including the reading. We, we uh, listed the books that, that are mentioned the, in, the, in there, including Little Women. Um, so lots of good things in the back. And speaking of education, Peggy, you were an interpreter at the site. Um, so when, when you worked there, Talk a little bit about how you taught the children. Well, I think, um, you know, ch since children, they have such wonderful imaginations and they're so open, you know, they're so, in, they have that sense of wonderment, you know, and, and I think that I just kind of have in some areas feel like I've never <laughs> grown up myself. I feel like, you know, there's something in me that does kind of, relate to children and understand their awe of the world, I guess. And and so that was something that I just, I loved um, relying on that openness of them and their willingness to imagine. And I think I would appeal to, you know, imagination a lot, you know, for instance, um, we would go into the, I'd bring them into the summer kitchen. And of course that room has got so many wonderful things to imagine. Um, and, and I would have them come in and sit down and, and, and think, okay, it's morning. It's the morning. What smells are you going to smell coming from this stove? What are you going to smell that reminds you of, of breakfast, for instance, you know, and they would come up with bacon and all these wonderful things. And so I, I tried to get them into the, into the moment, into the, you know, into, if we go into the Saudi, I would tell everybody to just be really quiet, be really quiet and hear what, what, what do you hear outside, you know, and, and kind of get that feeling of what it must have been like to live underground and um, the the sounds that you would have heard, you know, and then they start hearing things. They start hearing the wind in the grasses, or they hear a hawk or a bird or something, or an airplane. <laughs> Some of them would say, I hear an airplane, you know, and, and uh, but then that was a teaching tool too, you know, to basically say, well, you know, we have airplanes now, but see, that's something that they have an airplane then, you know to make those comparisons between now and in the past. So I guess that's what I, you know, wherever I went, I, you know, if I took them in the teepee or the bar lodge or whatever, it was always try to get them to imagine what it would have been like to live in this space. And you and Terry are still doing that as you promote your book. And I've put up a, a few events that are coming up in August and September. Um, I've had the privilege to attend a couple of their events that they've done at Gibbs Farm. They've been doing two events a month every, on Friday afternoons, um, and they've got two more coming in August, where you can go at noon and spend three hours um, kind of exploring um, some things with them and, and some really creative teaching things. And I'll let them talk a little bit about that um, in a minute, because 
uh, they'll they'll give you more information than I can. But and um and then also on this Saturday, if you've never been out to the Gideon and Agnes Pond House, they'll be doing a program out there on Saturday, um, and then they'll be doing uh, a bigger event in September at the Apple Fest. Terry, do you want to just add a little more about what, this program that you've been doing on Fridays and and kind of the teaching that both you and Peggy have been doing? Well, you know, at Gibbs Farm, there are thousands and thousands of children that come for field trips and the field trips are pretty prescribed by the buses. <laughs> buses rule the world. And so, you know, usually it's a two hour field trip. And that means that uh, kids are in a space for 15 minutes and then the school bell rings and everybody rotates. And this has just been such a joy to have a chance to spend time in other spots on the farm that we typically don't include in a tour because there just isn't time, but to have three whole hours. For instance, one of the questions I get all the time is, what kind of crops did Heman grow? Well, that's really interesting because Heman did grow crops. He grew crops for the farmer's market, but this is a double farm in a way because Jane also had a kitchen garden and that is so interesting in doing this research. Now I find out that Lily was part of both worlds, right? She's harvested those, strawberry, harvested those strawberries and later currants and helped with haying. So she's helping her dad in the running of that farm, but also helping her mother in harvesting foods out of the kitchen garden that would feed their family and feed the hired hands that were living there. Uh, so just so many um, different, I guess the biggest way to say it is just more in depth and really um, it's been a great mix of uh, ages and get to hear um, what adults would have to say and what children would have to say because most often when we're doing something like a field trip, it's almost all little kids and then the teachers and the chaperones, but this way it's been a lot of families and so just a really um, great way to have the site come more alive from a young girl. Uh, often that site gets talked about from Jane Gibbs perspective, which is great, but Jane Gibbs is an adult and children are children. And so for them to get to hear what it was like for someone like them to live on a farm back then, you know, I'm of an age that I grew up having aunts and uncles where I could go visit their farm. And today, and in Lily's time, over 50% of the people in America lived on a family farm. Today, it's fewer than 3%. So our kids really don't know much about where their food comes from. Peggy was talking about being in the summer kitchen. I just remember one time doing a tour with, and talking about churning butter and some little boy raised his hand and said, well, I don't get it. Why don't you just go to the grocery store and buy some butter? Because that's the... Uh, perspective that kids have today. Kids have very little understanding of what farm life was like. And so um, I think the Gibbs farm is such a gem. And I think that um, now hopefully having this book of a little girl actually living on this farm and what some of her experiences were like, um, I think it can really help to broaden the experience at Gibbs. I, I feel that way now when I'm talking about it to people. I feel like it's, um, instead of just uh, talking about it from a broader perspective, um, now we have more actual research, like you, you can go to any farm in the upper Midwest and they can tell you about churning butter and about taking the bath on Saturday night and you can practically close your eyes and every site would say the same thing because people have done research on those things, but they haven't done research on the people who live there. And so this is research about Lily and um, I think it's, uh, it's magical and it's a gift that we got from that family for, we got from Lily that she kept the records from the Karen Dosh family that gave the records to Ramsey County Historical Society that we're lucky enough that we have a research center that has kept these in a responsible way. So um, now it can all come to life. It's great. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so um, 
we're going to wrap it up here in a minute. So if you have any questions, you can put those in the chat. But just a reminder that um, the book is available at Ramsey County Historical Society. You can go to um, to this site here and order online, or you can go. But one thing we didn't cover tonight is Terry has created her own website, um, and so you can go through there to order it. But I mean, the most important thing of the website, it, it's a, it's a, an adorable website. It's a lot of fun. And if you've got kids and grandkids, go out there onto that website, explore it. There's information for, there's learning opportunities, history, all kinds of fun things. And of course it incorporates Peggy's lovely drawings. Um, but you can get the book from either place from our website um, at publishing.rchs.com or at Grasshoppers in My Bed, or you can just call the office and um, Robin can help you with uh, uh, getting that. They make great gifts. Um, the holidays will be coming up soon and they're just great gifts, not only for children, but for people of all ages. And it's 18 for members and 20 for non-members. Um, so now um, we will go to questions. Robin, I'm gonna let you kind of take over here because I, I can't see the questions that have been coming in um, and I'll let you kind of field those. Great, thank you, Terry and Peggy and Meredith for this great presentation. Um, if people would like to put your questions, please put them in the chat and we'll um, read those out for Peggy and Terry um, to answer. So um, Terry, do you wanna talk a little bit um, about, you talked quite, both of you talked quite a bit ab about your process in the, in, in creating the book. Um, so when you were at Gibbs Farm, why don't you talk about the impetus that made you even start the project at the very beginning? Because I don't think we really talked about that much. Well, when I got to Gibbs um, in 2007, we had one day camp, but um, I could see that the numbers had been going down and I started creating day camps. Uh, that's, I love programming, so I created a, a five day camps. And the very, but the very first day camp, um, I it was called Gibbs Girl. And um, I wanted to do a survey at the end of the camp, but because I can never say no, I let kids from age five to age 12 be in the day camp. And then I realized, well, Okay, those five and six year olds can't answer this survey. So, um, so instead I created a bunch of programs and we did these um, kind of cool programs as a way to have the survey. But then at the very end, one of the girls who was one of the older girls said, you know, this camp was so amazing. But what I really want to know is what it was like to live back then. And that just always stayed with me. And always for the whole 10 years I was at Gibbs, that was the driving impetus for every program that we created, whether on the pioneer end or on the Dakota end to make it more experiential, to make it more hands-on um, and to make it as real as we could. But the problem is, you know, as I said before, a field trip is two hours. Even if kids come to a day camp, it's maybe three days. And, but you know what? A book lasts forever. <laughs> and I feel like if, by putting these ideas in the book, and that's also why it kind of turned, not kind of, I did decide right from the beginning that I felt like, um, either, even though it's kind of a very unusual format, I didn't want to make up a story about Lily. I didn't want, it's, this book, it's kind of difficult, like, is it fiction? Is it nonfiction? Is it historical fiction? Well, the best genre to call it is historical fiction. But usually in historical fiction, there's a story, right? And this one doesn't really have this. It's a lot of little mini stories because it's a diary because I really felt that that was the best explanation of what life was really like day by day. There's a early on, there's a quote by Jane who says, life is just one thing after the next. And in a way that is what our lives are like every day, there's something new. And um, I felt like this would be a good way and, and hopefully answer that question for kids, what life was really like so, through a diary. Perfect, thanks, Terry. Meredith, if you wanna take down the slides, um, we don't have a lot of people here and I don't think we're gonna bog down. Um, so what I'm going to do is say thank you to Terry and Peggy for being here tonight and sharing this wonderful book. And thank you to Peter, 
for your sponsorship and to Judy at the Roseville Library. So um, again, come and see some more History Revealed programs. We appreciate everybody for being here.